Hello and welcome to another episode of D-Dubs Plays. Today I'm going to be teaching you everything you need to know about roads in vanilla city skylines. I'm going to start with the absolute basics, then we'll talk a bit about how you can make your roads look nice in your city. We'll move on to road hierarchy and how to make sure your roads flow efficiently. And then I'll finish up with some more tips about how you can reduce traffic. I'll put chapters in so it's easy to find the bits that you want. But let's get started. Now when you open your roads menu, you'll see that you've got several different tabs. We've got the small roads, we've got medium roads, we've got large roads, and we've got highways. Now in addition to each tab having more lanes than the tab before, the roads tend to have higher speed limits as well. This is important because when traffic pathfinds it uses both the distance and the speed limit of the roads when it calculates the most efficient route. Now just like any other network we can build roads on the ground, we can build them elevated and we can build them underground. Roads will also create bridges when you build them over water and you'll get different bridges depending on the type of road that you've used. This one here is using the industrial road. Now you may notice that if you put an industrial road elevated on dry land you'll just get a road that looks like that. You can actually create bridges like this over land and the way that you need to do that is by getting into your landscaping tools. lowering the land below where you want to draw it and then popping your bridge over that lowered area and we can tidy it up by using the level terrain tool and just leveling out the uh, ground underneath it so if you want to create a bridge over the land that would be how you did it now something that's important to note about the wider roads is that traffic will not always use all of the lanes so in a situation like this where there's no dedicated turning lanes, traffic will only use the right hand lane. So in order to get the traffic to use the other lanes we would need to create dedicated turning lanes and we can do this by adding turnings for the traffic to uh, take. So if for example we added some roads here, here and here we can now see that we have dedicated turning lanes for each of those junctions. You may notice that I've used two lane roads here. If we upgrade one of these roads to a four lane road, you'll notice that we now no longer have a dedicated turning lane for the left. It's a lane for both left and straight ahead. So that's something to bear in mind when you're trying to control your lanes on wider roads. Now let's have a look at our snapping tools. These can be both very helpful and very inconvenient depending on the situation. So it's very helpful to know which tools to use and when. The angle tool will allow you to snap to a 90 degree angle. So when I come off like this, you can see the angle there is at 90 degrees. I can pull it out of 90 degrees, but it will automatically snap back to 90 degrees. If you're on remastered, you can also adjust that so that you've got 45 degrees or five degree snaps, which is uh, quite useful. If you're on the older version, like I am at the moment, then uh, you've only got the 90 degree snap. But that's gonna make it much more easy for you to create a 90 degree angle. The next tool is the road length tool, and this is quite useful in a couple of ways. First of all, you'll see that as I draw it out, we get these guidelines up here. So at five units, the guideline will appear, and the guideline appears at 10 units. So it makes it very easy to judge your measurements. There again, five units, the next guidelines appeared, and that's at 10 units. So we know that that's a 20 unit road length there, just because we've got those guidelines to measure with. You'll also notice that as I move, it snaps by one unit at a time. So you know that you're always moving by a full unit. If I were to switch that off, and then draw a road, you'll see that I can draw it to any length, it doesn't snap at all. So I could be at nine and a half units, for example. This one here is the grid snapping tool. This will make the road snap to a position within the grid along an existing road. So as you can see, this is always centered in one of the grid slots. There may be occasions when you want to switch this off just because you want the roads to finish in a position that isn't directly in one of those grid slots, so 
if the grid's throwing your roads off then uh, switch that one off this one here is the road guidelines road guidelines are possibly the most useful and the most inconvenient they're the ones that i switch on and off the most often the road guidelines are these little dotted lines that come off of the nodes of existing roads the circle is at 10 units from the node and you'll get the dotted line out to 30 units away beyond that they will disappear if you've got your angle snapping on then you can come off at a 90 degree angle very easily like so and you can follow the direction very easily as well now these road guidelines can be very useful for making sure you've got the same space in between roads they're good for lining up parallel curves you can use them to find points of symmetry when you're building things like interchanges and you can just use them as markers so that you can place a new road in exactly the right place they're also very very inconvenient especially in something like an interchange build where you have a lot of nodes at a lot of different angles and in situations like that you might find that you'll snap into a road guideline when you want to get a different position so they just kind of get in the way sometimes so yeah it can be very useful to switch those on and off as needed when you're building something a little bit more complex and the last one we have here is the elevation step now by default it's set to the maximum elevation step which is this high you can also set it to a half step which is that height and the lowest elevation step is a quarter which is that height now I always keep it on the lowest step and the reason for that is that three quarters of the largest step is the minimum clearance to get over a road and I like to use the minimum distance. In my opinion bridges look a little bit too tall if they're on the full elevation step. I just think they look a little bit nicer, a little bit cleaner on a three quarters height but that may just be a personal preference thing. It's entirely up to you how you do your bridges. Now we mentioned grids as we were talking about the snapping tools there but there may be instances where you want to get rid of the grid so say for example you've got these two roads here and you only want your zoning to appear alongside this road you can get rid of the grids on this road by placing either a path or a fence now you can see that the grids actually disappeared a little bit here that's easy to fix just by redrawing the road in. You'll see you've got full grid there now. Now we're going to talk about curved roads. You draw curves in two axes. So as you can see for the first axis you get a dotted outline for your road. Once you press the button it will go solid and you can draw your second axis. I've got my angle snapping and my road length on so I've got a 90 degree curve here and it's 10 units up and 10 units across. With 90 degree curves, these measurements are useful because it makes it really, really easy to draw a parallel curve. If I draw another road here, the distance between these two nodes is three units. So all I need to do to make sure I've got a perfect parallel curve is add three to each of those measurements. So I go up by 11, 12, 13. Now here you can see an example of what I was talking about earlier. The road guideline is probably getting in my way there. So I'm going to switch off that road guideline to make sure that I get the ex exact measurement that I'm after. Now I want to make sure that I've got the correct starting point. So I'll just draw a small straight section out there. And then I'll go from there up 13 units and out 13 units. And this will work with any measurements that you want to use so for example if we did a road that goes up by 10 and across by 5 and we left a space of 5 then we just need to add that 5 to each measurement so we'd go up by 15 and out by 10 
and again you can see we've got a perfectly parallel curve. So that works nicely for 90 degree curves but what if your curve is not 90 degrees? So in this case I would find the point that I wanted to start at. Yeah let's say we want a spacing of two units between each road so that would be a space of four units between the nodes. We would bring our first measurement up so that it was level with the next node and then bring it in so that we've got the two units of space between the roads on the third node and then we can just repeat that for the remaining sections and again we've got a nice parallel curve there now it does look slightly janky at this end and that's because we've done this on terrain that isn't level so do bear in mind that if you're not building on flat ground you might get a little bit of jankiness but you'll still get a curve that looks pretty good now that was nice and easy for me to finish because we had an odd number of nodes there but let's say that we had an even number of nodes and we wanted to do the same thing so we'd go up to that first road guideline bring it into the second one now what do we do about this bit because we've got no fifth one to go to so what I would do in this situation is I would just add a little bit of straight road to this one create a parallel straight road that was the same length and then we can use this to create our final curve just judge by eye roughly where the halfway point is between the two nodes and join them up like that now there is another issue that you might come across if you happen to be working with quite gentle curves if we bring this road out um, almost straight then we can see that if we try and just do a very gentle curve there's a point where it will just snap and anything between that snap and straight you're going to really struggle to create a curve in now the way that we would deal with a curve that is gentle like that is we would get the straight road tool we would just bring out some very short sections of road off of every other node and then we would do exactly what we did before so use that first node as the center point and then having that little stub of road there will give us something to snap to even if the curve is quite gentle so um, that's another trick that you can use if you're working with very gentle curves then of course when you finish you just get rid of the uh, little stubs of road that you put in now i think in many cases when you're drawing parallel roads it's because you want them to act as opposite carriageways on a single road and in those cases you'd be using one-way roads to form your carriageways so a useful tip when drawing one-way roads is that the direction of the road will always be the direction you draw it in so i've drawn this one from left to right and you'll see that the arrows point from left to right if I then draw the next one from right to left, then the arrows will point from right to left. Now this is also true of roads that are not one way. Um, if I draw a road in that direction, even though you can't see which direction it was drawn in, as soon as I upgrade it to a one way road, you'll see that it points in the direction that it was drawn in. A useful tip for when you're drawing one way roads, which can save you a bit of time switching all of those directions around. Another useful tip when you're working with parallel roads, often you'll want to put in a junction or a slip road and it can be a lot easier to do that when your nodes are lined up. So you can actually move the nodes along on roads just by drawing a straight piece of road. If I wanted my slip road to be at this point on both carriageways for example, I could just draw in a small section of road, make sure it's straight and pop it in there. Then when I remove it, I will have nodes that are in exactly the same place on both carriageways which makes it really easy for me to line up where my slip roads join on now it's important to note that you can't move nodes that join a curved piece of road to a straight piece of road the game treats these as if they are corner nodes and they won't move you can move the nodes that are on curves like this one and you can move the nodes that are on straight pieces you just can't move the nodes that join curves and straight pieces together Okay, so what do we do to end our parallel roads? Well, a simple solution could be to just place in a stretch of road like this. You are going to have some issues here though, because the space between these two nodes is so small, you can't fit a vehicle in there. So um, that is going to cause a little bit of traffic issues. Another option is to merge those roads. Now, the way that I do this is I start off by bringing out a piece of road 
like so. Then I'll come down a bit. I'll switch to my four lane roads and I will switch off both grid snapping and road length. And then I'll just bring this out. And then just judging by, I get that blue line about halfway across the grid square at the top of the screen there. Then we can delete this piece, bring this up. Is that gonna to be too close? No, I think that's fine. And then we've got a nice piece of road centered. Now, if we switch back to a two lane road, you'll find that you can put one in, but the other one won't go in because they're too close together. Now, the way around this is instead of using those roads, if we switch to the dirt road, which is a little bit narrower, we can get that in on both sides and we can then use the upgrade tool to upgrade them to the, uh, let's use the one way roads, the one way industrial roads. We can then use that to upgrade these roads to the one way roads that we were using. Again, we've got quite a short distance between nodes there, which will cause traffic to slow down a little bit, but it's gonna flow a bit more smoothly than it would if you just had a T-junction there. Now let's take a moment to talk about slopes. We can join an elevated road and bring it down to the ground like so, and create a nice little slope. Or we can start at the ground and draw towards our elevated road and it will automatically create the slope for us. Now the maximum length that the game will let you do this is 12 units. As you can see, we can drop that down to the ground at 12 units, but as soon as we go to 13 units, it will snap back. 12 units is actually the maximum distance between two nodes, which is uh, why it's that length. But this limitation is only on a section that actually meets the ground. I you can see if I go only two steps down, I can make this slope as long as I like, and we can use this to our advantage to create longer slopes. Now let's say I want my slope to be 15 units instead of 12. I'm at one, two, three steps of elevation. So if I divide 15 by three, I get five. Now, as we demonstrated, I can't go all the way down to the ground because the slope will be too short. But if I go down two steps and come out by 10 units and then draw the last five units separately, I can now get a perfectly smooth 15 unit slope. And this will work for any distance. So we could go 14 units for our first two steps and then seven units for the final step. You get the idea. Of course, I'm using three units of elevation, but if you wanted to use four units of elevation, then you could do, for example, 15 units for your first three steps and then five units for the last step. And you get the same effect. So now that we've learned how to draw our roads, let's talk about how we keep our traffic flowing. At the heart of a good road network is its structure, and we call that structure our road hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy, we have highways. Highways are the fast, long distance roads that allow your traffic to get from one side of the city to the other with minimal interruption. You want interchanges to be well spaced on your highway network. You don't want them slowing down the traffic any more than they have to and your highways are there to link all of the important parts of your city together with a nice high speed route. Next on the hierarchy, we have arterial roads. Arterial roads connect your highways to the rest of the city. They're the only roads that interchanges should connect to. Like your highways, they should have junctions well spaced and you should avoid placing any zoning or buildings directly on your arterial roads. Arterial roads then connect to your collectors. These are generally smaller, slower roads than your arterials, but still bigger and faster than your local road network. And of course, below the arterials, you have local roads. So your local roads are the ones that your buildings and zoning should be on. You can place buildings and zoning on your collectors, but do take into consideration the traffic levels that you're expecting on those roads before deciding whether it would be appropriate to place buildings along it. Your arterials, you really want to avoid placing any kinds of buildings or assets directly on them as 
vehicles entering and exiting those buildings can slow down traffic and you really want your arterials to be as free flowing as possible and of course your highways you can't place anything alongside anyway now for the purposes of our example here i have represented each step in the hierarchy with a different size road but that's not necessarily a hard and fast rule you may have an arterial that doesn't have particularly heavy traffic or you don't have a lot of turnings off of it and a four lane road might be perfectly suitable for that particular arterial it doesn't necessarily have to be a six lane road likewise a two lane road may be perfectly adequate for your collectors and in fact i very frequently use two lane roads for collectors rather than four lane roads your local roads however are probably always going to be two lane roads i think it's a very rare use case where you'd need more than a two lane road for a local road the point here is that the step in the road hierarchy that a road represents is more about its function than the actual road that is used. The function of your highways is to get your traffic long distances across your city as quickly and efficiently as possible. The function of your arterials is to take traffic from your highways into your cities and to link your city districts together. The function of collectors is more to provide good access across individual districts. And the function of the local roads is to provide access to the buildings in your cities. Now let's take a quick look at this map and uh, think about how we might lay out the road structure here. The first thing that I would do is look at my info views and see where my resources are on the map. Now we can see over in this direction we've got oil, we've got arable land and we've got ore. We've got plenty of forestry across the map. There's some more arable land over here. So for the purposes of example, let's just buy up some of these areas. I think on this map, I would probably do something along the lines of this. Just going to use the industry painting tool to paint out roughly where I would put my uh, industry areas. So we'd obviously want an oil industry over here. We'd need to put our ore industry over here somewhere. Now I like to make sure that I've got smaller industrial areas with a good bit of space between them. So I'd probably choose somewhere over here maybe for the agricultural area. And then we've got options for the forestry area. Um, I think maybe I would probably go over here for forestry. I think on this map there's a nice big flat area here which would make a good area for a downtown. That would be another area that we'd want to link up with our highway network. Now we can see over here there is a shipping line in this direction. That's something I'd take into consideration as well. We'd want to uh, provide reasonably good highway access to wherever we put our port. Okay, so I've drawn out this really, really basic idea of where I might put the highways in this city. And the reason that I've kept it so basic is because when I start a city, this is pretty much all I've got in my mind. I've had a look at where the industrial areas are, where the outside connections are, thought about where I might put my downtown, possibly even where I might put the airport as well, and used those to give me an idea of where I need to link everything up. This is also going to inform where a lot of my interchanges are going to be. Obviously, I'm going to want an interchange next to each of the industries areas. So there's gonna be interchanges around these spots here. I'm going to want an interchange near the harbour area. I'll probably want two or three around the downtown area. And obviously all of the interchanges are going to need to be linked up with arterial roads. So that's going to give me the start of the structure of my arterial network as well. So just starting out with this basic idea in your mind of where you want your highways to go as your city develops is really going to help towards making sure you've got a good solid road hierarchy as your city develops. And like I said, it's not pretty, but it's all I will start with in my mind when I start a city. And as the city grows, that image will become more and more refined and I'll get a much more clear idea of uh, what the city is going to develop into as it grows. But yeah, just to start out, just have a basic idea of where the highways are gonna go and everything else will come from that. At least it does for me. <laughs> now, whilst we're talking about highways, 
I will just stress again that your highway interchanges should be well spaced. This example here is probably the absolute minimum spacing that I would put between highway interchanges. And it's not even interchanges, it's the slip roads between interchanges. The interchanges themselves would be over here and over here somewhere. So yeah, that, that space in there, that's probably about 40 units or so. That, as I say, is the minimum that I would have between the, uh, the slip roads of interchanges. In most cases, I would probably put them a little bit further apart than that. The last thing you want is to have one of your interchanges back up and then the traffic back up from that interchange onto the highway and then that blocks the next interchange cause and that one to back up and yeah, it could just create a traffic nightmare. So yeah, keep those interchanges well spaced on your highways. Now let's talk for a moment about roundabouts. It's always a good idea to brace a roundabout by that I mean just drawing a little cross of road between the nodes to keep it in place. If you do that then when you place a road anywhere on it it will keep its shape. If I get rid of the bracing here and I draw a piece of road anywhere that isn't on a node then you'll see the roundabout deforms. So bracing roundabouts is very helpful to uh, make sure they keep them keep their shape. Now you may notice that I've used three lanes on this roundabout and that's just to help with the traffic management. You can see the right hand lane here has got a arrow that allows traffic to go either straight ahead or to turn off. We don't have a dedicated turning lane which could potentially be very helpful if we had a lot of traffic here. We can create dedicated turning lanes um, but they do make your roundabouts look a little bit funky. So on this side, I have switched it from three lane to two lane just after the uh, turning, and then it goes back to three lane again. As you can see, it does look a little bit weird, but that does also give us a dedicated turning lane on the outside lane here. So that's just gonna help your traffic flow a little bit. Because it makes the roundabouts look weird, I would only use this if you've got a lot of heavy traffic on a roundabout, but um, yeah, it will help to make sure that the traffic is using the correct lane. To do this, basically all I did was I had my roundabout braced, like so. Let's put turnings on all of these junctions here. And basically I just created a node in the middle like that. I'll do it on the, all three of these. You can see just how funky your roundabouts will look. Let's go a little bit further on that one. There we go. And about there. We're going to try upgrading these. It doesn't always work. Sometimes the sections are too short. But we'll go to two lane highway. Yeah, too short on that one. That one will let us upgrade it. And that one will. So this one, it won't let us upgrade it. So what we'll do instead is we'll just delete that section and then we will redraw it with the curved road, like so. And then we'll get rid of all of these little marker roads that we put in. So as you can see, it does make the roundabout look a bit funky. We'll get rid of the, the braces as well. Kind of get a little bit of a funny square shape in the middle but that will give you a dedicated turning lane for each of your turnings off of the roundabout. And that in turn will help with the traffic flow. Another thing that's important to note is that anytime you create a junction on one of the larger roads, you will get a set of traffic lights. Now, if we go to the query tool, this first tool on the toolbar, bring up the radial menu and select intersections, we can see we have a traffic light there. All we need to do is just select that traffic light and it will give us the options to either turn it back on again or turn on stop signs. Now the stop sign just causes the cars to stop briefly before they pull out. It just slows down the rate at which they'll pull out into the main road and that in turn will help keep the main road flowing a little bit quicker. Now in a low traffic situation, you can get away with this. You don't really need stop signs or traffic lights. If you've got heavy traffic on one of the roads, 
which in this case would most likely be the larger road. You can use the stop signs to keep the traffic flowing along that road. And in situations where you have heavy traffic in multiple directions, traffic lights might actually be the best option for controlling the traffic flow. Stop signs are usually also a good idea when you're building roundabouts, so uh, something to bear in mind. Just as a quick refresher, you can access that via the inspector tool, bringing up the radial menu and then selecting intersections. You can also access it by going to info views, going down to traffic routes and using the shoulder button to select junctions. And as you can see, we've got the junction controls there. Now some other things that are worth noting. I mentioned when I was drawing these in that I like to put in smaller industrial areas that are well spaced out. And the reason for that is that industry generates a lot of traffic. It's much better to have high traffic generating areas smaller and well spaced out than all of that high traffic generating area in one place. Because the traffic it generates is more dispersed if it's more spaced out. And if it's more dispersed, you don't have to deal with it all trying to go through the same junction, for example. So yeah, wherever possible, try and disperse those high traffic generating areas, spread them out as much as possible so that the traffic is spread out as much as possible. Another common issue that I see causing traffic issues is just having choke points in your city. So let's say for example, I had an interchange here and it was getting really backed up. The first question I'd ask myself is, where is all that traffic coming from and does it have another way to get onto the highway? Maybe I've got a high traffic generating area here and it's all trying to come through a junction here. So by putting another junction over here, I can split that traffic in two. The stuff that's closer to this side will come up to this junction and the stuff that's closer to this side will come up to this junction. That's just gonna ease some of the pressure on that choke point. So whenever you've got really busy junctions, intersections, whatever it may be, one of the first things you should be asking yourself is where's the traffic coming from, where's it going to, and can I provide it with alternative routes? Because quite often one or two alternative routes will be all you need to ease the pressure on that junction and get the traffic flowing through it properly again. And my last top tip for managing your traffic, and possibly the most important tip of all, is do not underestimate the power of footpaths, cycle paths and public transit. Every sim that is walking, cycling or taking a bus, tram, whatever transit methods you've got in your city is a sim that isn't driving a car. That's a car that's not on the roads. I cannot overstate how important it is to have good pedestrian infrastructure, good cycling infrastructure and good transit in your cities. It will do your traffic situation wonders. Now there was an awful lot to cover in today's episode. I don't think I missed anything important, but if you do have any tips, tricks, or if you think I left something out that I really should have included, please do let me know down in the comments. Hopefully you found this episode useful and I will catch you in the next one.